Welcome to an action-packed edition of World Religions with Dr. Elry. Today we're going to be talking about Indian magic or pragmatic rituals. So uh, according to standard academic culture these days, I'll put a little bit of what we call a trigger warning on the front of this. We're going to be talking about uh, a lot of aggressive rituals, what most people, especially Indians in every vernacular, whether it be Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, will even use the English terms black magic. I prefer the term aggressive magic. If you were to ask the average Indian about the type of materials I'm gonna go over, they'd say, oh yeah, yeah, that stuff exists. But then they'd say, whoa, none of us do it. And the reality of it is not a lot of Indians do these practices, though I am beginning to uncover that while I'm working with predominantly historical texts, these traditions still exist in India today. And there's definitely anxiety about them today. But if you ask the average Indian in diaspora, so an Indian that you would meet sort of uh, living just kind of near you, Indian Hindu especially, if you ask them about this, they'd say, oh, that's we don't do that. That's barbaric. That's all in the past, whatnot. Um, so we are going to talk about aggressive magic, a lot of which will be remarkably sexual. And um, I think it's really interesting. And what we're getting to is none, no less than sort of uncovering and revealing a type of ritual and a tradition of ritual that is virtually undiscussed in the documentation on Indian culture and on the history of magic across the world, and especially within Hinduism or Hinduism 101 class. So with that, I give you my original research. You can't read this anywhere unless I wrote about it. Uh, there have been some prior studies of this, but nothing as extensive as what we read for today and what we'll be covering. So here we go. So, om cha cha, om cha cha. I, I just like that mantra. It's just, I like to open and kind of a lecture with a cha cha cha. So, the operator buries a bilva wood stake consecrated with 1,000 repetitions of the mantra, om cha, om cha cha. His target, along with the family, will become ghosts or pretas. Uh, a preta, one who has gone forth, is an unhappy ghost, often depicting as having very hungry, hungry, hungry bellies and terrible thirst with these tiny little throats that can't even suck up one piece of rice. Om, Hrim, give so-and-so to me, swaha. Um, so that would be the mantra when making an offering. He consecrates a five angula long, angula is like a finger's breadth, uh, a five angula stake made of patala wood with 1,000 repetitions of the mantra, having inserted his target's name into the so-and-so spot in the spell. He will immediately acquire that maiden. So this is one of many sort of erotic acquisition and subjugation rites that we'll see throughout. Um, intriguingly, there was a wonderful book by Christopher Farone that I teach in my magic and religion class called uh, Greek Erotic Magic or Ancient Greek Love Magic. I think it's the actual title. And you'd be surprised at how similar these sounds, which brings up another argument for why we're looking for this, looking through this material. It's ripe for comparison and hasn't really been worked on across the world. So if you're, if you hear materials today that sound interesting or intriguing to you or similar to you as something that you know about, please let me know. All right, so what are magic rituals in general? Well, I've discussed that when you use the word magic, it conflates three ideas. The magical, so that's the adjective for anything surreal or supernatural or, or even, um, even super competent, like that guy is a magical uh, basketball player. Then you have magic powers, so those are like superpowers, a power granted to you by God or in these days as a superhero through mutation or contacts with uh, the Captain America project if you follow Mar Marvel Comics. So that's having like a superpower, so magical powers. And then you have magic rituals, which we are looking at today. Magic rituals are discrete ritual actions that cause a change to the world. Now we need a little bit of vocabulary here. So I call the full magical ritual an operation. And then the person who's doing it, the agent, the sorcerer, the magician, I call him or her, usually him, the operator. Then we have who is the target or the victim for the spell. I go back and forth between target and victim because sometimes, rarely, <laughs> the results are actually positive. So that would be your target. Um, there is a distinction here that I like to use between pragmatic and transcendental rules of religions. This was established by a guy named Mandelbaum. Uh, and I really like his ideology here or his idea here. So transcendental. That is something that attains heaven, communion with the gods, 
overall like working through society so initiation rituals worship rituals the catholic mass is a worshipful ritual um any type of sort of the vedic rites that ensure a soul is transformed so that it can attain a heavenly realm whereas pragmatic is just what it sounds it makes a this worldly change get a good grade on a test find your lost goat slaughter your enemy so pragmatic versus transcendental and here we are looking at what i call magic to be pragmatic ritual technologies now a few caveats as i said before this is not mainstream hinduism though it is mainer stream hinduism than people would believe this uh will have a quite about we will have quite a bit of discussion of sex and violence and i will also read some of these mantras out loud i read them mostly in translation so i think you can assume that they won't have an effect otherwise i've argued these things don't work but they do work, as we'll talk about at the end. Um, so yes, and don't go just assuming that this is sort of standard ritual practice amongst Hindus, though um, I am finding and research is proving in the last few years that quite a few of these traditions are still operated, but mostly uh, in a secretive manner. All right, so magical rituals in Hinduism. Um, so magic rituals in Hinduism include sort of three facets. One, you have the Shat Karmani or um, Shadkarmani or Shatkarmani. This means the six results. These are aggressive black magic. These are um, various results that uh, I'll list in a minute that range from everything from tranquilizing and getting prosperity to getting rid of your enemy, making them like run away from you or drawing someone toward you, maybe to seduce them or kill them or even murdering them. Then you have fantastic feats and enchanted forms, Kautuka Karma or Indra Jala. Indra Jala means like the net of Indra and is a uh, euphemism for magic in general. Kautuka Karma really means just like this fantastic, wonderful thing. So in this, stuff that doesn't fit into the six results, I include into these fantastic feats, such as an enchanted item, such as making slippers that allow you to fly into the sky or walk on water, goggles so you can see under the earth, um, find treasures, uh, lamps that the flame will go up when you're over gold or buried treasure. Um, so enchanted items, a fantastic feat such as, you know, turning invisible or um, uh, what's another one? Uh, uh, bringing the dead back to life. And finally, you have conjuring female entities. So yakshini sadhana. Sadhana just means a religious discipline or practice. And yakshini are um, sort of mythic tree spirits and um, dry, so dryads, they are associated with trees. But um, I just use Yakshini Sadhana here because it's the usual name for it. You also have Yogini Sadhana, so of those scary female animal-headed Yoginis. Bhutanis are ghosts that are female. The important thing is here, it's conjuring female entities and getting them to do what you want. So these rituals are simple. They're literal. You just read them in the Sanskrit and you just, it's sometimes hard to figure out what the ingredients are because the nouns are weird, but they're really simple. It's like you get this and this and this and you do this and this and this with them and you say this mantra, boom. So what I'm arguing here that they're literal. Some people have gone back and sort of interpreted these as being sort of figurative. Like when you're doing a murder ritual, you're actually trying to murder someone's bad karma or you're only doing the murder when it's time, when someone's going to do something so bad they'll endanger their soul. No, these are literally, when it says you're trying to seduce someone, you're trying to seduce someone. When you're trying to eradicate someone, get them to leave forever, that's what you're actually doing. You're looking to subjugate them, make them your slave. That's it. You're not subjugating their ego so that their great soul can manifest or something like that. It's also not stage magic. It's not prestidigitation. It's not ledger domain. It's not the linking rings. It's not sawing a woman in half. It's not stage magic. Uh, in any way, these, uh, as I said once again, when I was saying that the rituals were um, simple and literal in the sense that uh, they um, are not visualized, they're physically enacted. You're not, you will see later texts that describe acting out these rituals sort of in your mind or in your heart. What are some of the things you do in these rituals though? Um, is drawing uh, magical diagrams called yantras, offering spells, so speaking spells or mantras, combining substances together, creating empowered items, offerings into a fire, which is called homa, tribute offerings or bali, so that's making an offering to an entity to get them to do what you want, conjuring up semi-divine agents or tutelary deities. Uh, as I said, it's not staged magic. We have a wonderful word called jadugar, 
for a sort of stage magic. And in India, you have a long tradition of magic being done on the streets. Uh, and a less long tradition, last like 100, 150 years, of Indian conjurers who dress sort of like in tuxedos with turbans and do large scale magic tricks uh, and illusions. So scholars have argued kind of across cultures, and this is maintained here, that magic is illegal. It is always considered illegal. Well, we see in, Mon in the Manuskriti, one of our earliest texts of Sanskrit sort of legal traditions, that sorcery or abhichara, malicious conjuring, kritya, malicious, that's like creating evil creatures to send against someone, and root magic or combining substances, um, and the, or, or root cutting as we call it in English. It's mula karma there in, in the Sanskrit. So it's, it's literally like making stuff with like roots of herbalism and whatnot. Um, later sources will argue that, uh, that that magic that causes death, if someone is found to discover or is discovered to have performed a magic ritual that killed someone, then you kill that person. If it hasn't killed someone, then they get um, specific fines assessed to them. So magic is sort of overall illegal. What are our sources here? Well, our sources here that I'm drawing from is from a body of text I call the Ud Corpus. Now you'll see these really long, wacky Sanskrit names, but just listen to them. Udisha Tantra, Udameshwara Tantra, Udamara Tantra, Virabhadra Tantra, that's off a little bit, and the Dhamara Tantra. They all have that Ud sound in them. So I just call them sort of the Ud Corpus. Now, these are primarily Tantras, and when I'm talking about Tantras, I'm talking about texts that sort of start in the early medieval era, era that represents sort of hyper-ritualized form of religions. If anything that the Tantras really do more than anything is they describe a ton and ton and ton of rituals. The reason why I connect all these texts together is because various versions of this text or this, yeah, I, I mean almost this text are found under all sorts of different names. So I can find an Udameshwara Tantra that looks like an Udisha Tantra that looks like an Udamara Tantra or what I see in those. So I, there's no way to actually pull them apart because their contents overlap so much. So what I think was going on when these texts were written is there was just, it was almost a genre of texts that were on sort of these magical practices. And then people would just slap a title onto them. Usually one that started with Ud and was like Udam, Udisha or Udameshwara, Ud, Udamara, Udamara. Ud, or Udameshwara. All right, so that was some really convoluted Sanskrit, and I actually didn't even pronounce all those words properly because they, you know, they're, they're hard for us to hear if we're not used to hearing them. But these are lovely, weird little texts. So you can see on the left, these are some Sanskrit manuscripts. You can see that they're all handwritten. We didn't have printed texts of these until like the late 19th century. And when I'm doing a lot of my research on them, I use these sort of handwritten tantras. Uh, these handwritten texts, and then you can see them, how they're in a long stack and they're loose leaf, they're not bound in any way. Um, so even the word for a text is called granta, which is, refers to the string, called a sutra, that goes through the hole in the middle of the text that holds them all together. So when we're talking about uh, texts, we're not talking about books in the way that we think of them. All right, so what are the six results, the first part of Indian magic that I'm gonna talk about? Well, whether there are six of them, eight of them, or 88 of them, they're still called the six results. I've looked at Shatkarmani Udisha texts that have upwards of, of 60 types of rituals that they call the six results. Now, there's um, something similar to this. In the, in the yoga traditions, you'll hear about a Shatkarma, a Shatkarma, um, but that refers to six preliminary practices that one does before practicing hatha yoga. So cleaning the mouth, specific types of bodily activities and whatnot. There are also sometimes under the shat karma, you'll see nine to 90 different initial practices, but they're all just called the six acts. So overall, here's the quick list of the shat karma that we'll be talking about today. We have shanti pusti, which means tranquilizing or increasing. Vashikarana, so subjugating, making someone your slave. Stambana, immobilizing, halting movement, or causing something to become ineffective or impotent. Mohana, bewildering. Vidveshana, descent. Uchattana, eradicating. Akarshana, uh, attracting from a long distance. And murder, marana. Uh, I've selected these eight because uh, one of the main sources that I've worked on, one the, one of the Udisha Tantra that I'm most that I most enjoy and I've almost just decided to use as my main text to compare, to compare everything to, lays them out in this way. But all the other texts will have different lists of six 
um, but somewhat in this order. So what is Shanti? So Shanti comes from the, uh, the Sanskrit root Sham, which means to tranquilize. It derives from the root Sham, as I said, meaning to quiet, to calm, or pacify. And the category extends by way of euphemism to aggressive actions, such as to conquer, to remove, or kill, or just to quiet. Just like in English can mean to, well, just like to quiet, to quiet something can mean to make dead. In Vedic sacrifice, when they slaughter the horse, they say, ha ha, it has been tranquilized. They don't say we've strangled it or we've cut it up or we've killed it. It was used, so in this, te in this sense, uh, I haven't found Shanti rites that are complete euphemisms for to kill, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're out there. Often people graft onto this ritual, and I have a tranquilizer gun there, uh, pushti, which means worldly prosperity. So they'll say shanti pushti and they'll put them together, even though amongst all of the categories of magic, these have the fewest of the rituals and the less description of them. There's two types of shanti, one is transitive and one is non-transitive. So in the transitive sense, I'm tranquilizing something, I'm causing something to be quieted. In the non-transitive sense, I am causing um, myself to become tranquil, and it depends on the text as to how it is read. Uh, in the ritual, you would assume that maybe shanti is used to ward off other aggressive sorcery. And in ethnography or anthropology work, we have seen this to be the case, but I haven't found it in the texts that shanti is used to tranquilize the more aggressive rituals. So let's look, here's a quick uh, tranquilizing mantra. So this is the spell that would, one would use, the mantra would use in the performance of the ritual. Om, tranquilize, tranquilize, destroy all misfortune, swaha. So Om usually starts a mantra and is the in all embodied sound of all sounds of the universe, like the great primordial sound. And then swaha is what you say at the end of a mantra. It means something like, um, there it is, or it is finished. And there's not a good translation of it, but when you offer something into a fire and a home or a fire offering, the minute you offer it, you say swaha. And that's like the offering. Like I like to think of swaha as meaning like, all right, it's done, or I relinquish it or something like that. Um, okay, so if one does 100,000 repetitions, using, using beads to keep up, you wouldn't take little hash marks. Um, repetitions will permanently tranquilize everything. Sarvi shanti, sarva shanti bhavek. Here it's really talking about tranquilizing hostile entities, whether that's demons, whether it's like anger spirits or fevers or whatnot. There is a further non-transitive discussion of, uh, of shanti. Um, this is found in another text, the Udameshwara Tantra, which describes the offering of a white cow to bring general well-being including ease of movement, gaining sons, wives, wealth. Uh, the difficult becomes easy and it grants happiness. But also uh, in this ritual, it says that he that desires peace will gain peace. Uh, that's shanti arti shanti mapnuti. So this is extended with another mantra that goes om glam gam ganesha namaha. This may sound interesting to you because it has the seed syllables, which are non semantic things, the glam, the gum, they just, they don't mean anything, but they are associated associated with the god Ganesh. Remember Ganesh, the elephant-headed god? So if you practice, if you uh, chant Om Gam, Om Glam Gam Ganeshaya, Ganeshaya Namaha during the three major points of the day, so the morning, noon, and night, for seven days, it will cause tranquility. And if you continue to do this, on the eighth day, you'll achieve wisdom and happiness. After one month, one will gain majesty. After six months, you become mega, mega rich. After one year, one will possess omniscience. So that's an awful lot of bang for your buck for uh, just chanting this mantra three times uh, during three sessions every day. The results are pretty much as wide ranging as they are kind of vague. Right, so, so that was the last nice one. <laughs> Everything's gonna be bad from here on out, or at least mean spirited. So here we have subjugation or vashikarana. So um, this is derived from the Sanskrit root vash, which means something like um, to control, to dominate, to take possession of. So vash, um, yes. 
Uh, it's the most expansive of the results, and it also contains the most sort of herbal lore. So when I when I say herbal lore, I mean combining various substances, minerals, herbs, food types, animal products, a lot of use of milk and urine. Um, with some of the more aggressive ones, there's a lot of use of blood. Okay, so uh, one thing, the other things you see is that subjugation rites um, often use sort of enchanted talaks. See this gentleman over here, and he has this mark on his head? So that's a talak or a forehead marking. So what is interesting to me about this is if I want to subjugate the world, I put this magic talak on my head, and then anybody that sees that talak is subjugated. Now, how does that work? Well, in the Indian traditions, you have this idea like your eyes put out your force sense, like a sense of force and like a ray of light. And it touches something, and then that sense turns, it's transformed by touching something, and comes back to you. So the idea is your ocular sense goes out, touches that magic to lock, gets all screwy, comes back, and it affects you. So it's almost like transmission by sight line. Uh, yes. Also, we see quite a bit of erotic lore uh, that's going to come in through subjugation, which makes sense because you're trying to bind someone under your will, and erotic dominance or sexual dominance seems to be one of our key things as human beings in thinking about how we dominate other human beings. We most dominate in our sexual practices. At least that's how people think. There's a lot of ambiguity on that one. All right, so let's look at some of these rites. Uh, the first one we're going to look at has, yeah, here we are, has a mantra. The mantra is to a god named Udameshwara. Remember, we have an Udameshwara tantra. Um, the hollering lord. So, Om, reverence to the lord. The hollering lord. Bewilder. Bewilder. Assemble. Assemble. Ha, ha, fa, ha. Interestingly, uh, he calls them to bewilder. That's another one of our rights. But here it's listed under subjugation. So, one uses this mantra uh, in order to create an enchanted talak, mixing wood apple leaves, sweet lime ground with goat's milk, and then all who see the talak are dominated. But you can also use this mantra to create a sort of poison pill in which you combine five portions each of panic grass, uh, tagara, costus, um, Boy, I'd, I'd give you the Sanskrit, but the Latin's weird enough. And the snake hair plant and the intoxicating black datura. The pill is made in the shade and placed into the victim's food or drink to subjugate a man or woman for their entire life. Look out what you eat. It could be poisoned by magic. Um, here's a an erotic rite that I found in the Udameshwara Tantra that I've always been intrigued by because if you notice, there's no mantra. There's no mantra at all here. And not only is there no mantra, but there's no, there's just an action, and it's not really a ritual action. So after intercourse, he gathers his own semen with his left foot and smears it on the left foot of a woman. She becomes his slave. Now it turns around. After intercourse, should a woman touch the penis of her lover with her left foot, then as long as he lives, he will be her slave. There is no doubt. So this is just like something you do. No spell, no concoction. I, I, I've always found that really intriguing that they just kind of throw that in there. All right, so how about a few further erotic subjugation rites? So um, to enslave a woman by topical application, so by smearing something on her skin, we read grind black lotus, bees wings, pagoda root, and white crowshank plant and place it upon the head of an elegant young woman who instantly becomes a slave. Now, intriguingly, we have black lotus and bee's wings. Uh, the bee is associated with love and sort of loving emotions, and the, and the bee is also considered black. So there's the connecting the black lotus and the, uh, and, the, and the bee's wings makes a lot of sense here because they are putting sort of the qualities of those things in the natural world onto the person that they are applying them to. All right, how about some more? Uh, a woman may employ subjugating oils such as kulata pods, wood apple leaves, orpiment, which is bile, red arsenic, um, this is Manaha you see that uh, also in, in kumkum powder, the red powder that Indians use in a lot of rituals, and equal portions combined in a copper bowl and fermented for seven nights. Then the oil is heated in the bowl with the mixture together. Having smeared her vulva with the infused oil, she amorously approaches her husband. 
at the culmination of intercourse, her husband becomes her slave, no doubt. So there, you have a uh, you have a different sort of poison applied, and it's sort of um, it's created then and then is applied through intercourse. So among these subjugation rights are quite a few sexual enhancements that call to mind late night television commercials, pop up internet ads, and dubious wellness magazines. I'm looking at you, goop. Uh, one should smear his penis with boar fat and honey and honey slash liquor. Magu, it could be either. Uh, and for a month. His penis will be firm, strong, and long. So, you know, we've all seen these, these advertisements before. But sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose. Um, we read that age may not hinder or need not hinder seduction powers. And this is what I'm talking about, plastics or enhancement. For people, tree leaves, three, uh, three myrobolum fruits, juice and skin of the ginger, curds, so that would be dairy curds, and ghee or clarified butter are smeared upon a woman's best part, i.e. her vulva, and it becomes sweet like honey. A man can make even an old woman equal to a maiden. There's also um, plenty of rights for making breasts go from hanging in pendulous to firm and like mangoes, um, and well, quite a few rights for turning gray hair black and for removing wrinkles. Immobilization, stop. So immobilization is derived from the root stumb, which means uh, to become solid, to support or to suppress. These rights halt an individual, freezing him in place. Now immobilization also can render something impotent, removing its ability to do something, halting its effectiveness. So in this waters cannot drown, clouds cannot storm, fires burn, weapons harm, nor fists strike. Immobilization quite simply stops motion. Now, um, this is one of my favorite immobilization rights, and uh, I like this picture of the kudzu taking over the truck. And one of my favorite superheroes there, Swamp Thing, who often has the power to manipulate tendrils um, and green plants, and he will use that to freeze people in place by having them get grown over. So let's read it. The practitioner deposits white abrus pectarius seeds into dirt in a human skull cup. He makes tribute offerings of milk poured into the skull cup. Consequently, the tree becomes rooted, like the person, the target becomes rooted like a tree. Creepers and limbs seize him, fixing him in his place. He immobilized where he stands. So look at this, you create a version of the person effectively and put them like somehow in that pot. And then when the, when the little seed grows, that's like tendrils growing over that person, locking them in place. So um, while the majority of stumbling rituals are about uh, stopping movement in general, there are some intriguing ones, like this one that is water immobilizing, which prevents drowning. It doesn't actually stop water's general motion, uh, it stops rushing water from sweeping away a drowning man, pulling him to his death, or even rushing into his lungs. In this ritual, is actually, which is actually quite long, I just want to speak in summary, um, the waters are made impotent. But how does he do that? Well, the sorcerer collects eyes, teeth, blood, flesh, and hearts of air-breathing water creatures, namely crabs, tortoises, dolphins, crocodiles, otters, and snakes. He cooks that down, all of those fleshy substances, and uses it in a worship ritual. Then he smears it on a person's body. Once it's smeared upon, smeared upon that person's body, all of those substances from those water-breathing animals, he's able to move with ease in the water, unable to drown. So the person becomes like a non-drowning water-dwelling creature that breathes the air. You have the ease of being in the water than an otter or a crocodile does. This is very much sympathetic magic, which we'll come back to. Sympathetic magic means you take qualities of the natural world and put them onto your ritual target. Um, that's one way of thinking of it. Another one is like this, like this. So if I have a ritual in which I want to kill someone, I put, I install their soul into an effigy, and then I cut that effigy in half. And by cutting the effigy in half, it's like cutting them in half. So it's natural correspondences in the world, and it's also that um, megacot or 
microcosm, macrocosm, that what I do in this little space will happen to that large outer space. Other targets include weapons that become harmless on a day when the sun is in the astrum of Pushya. Don't worry about that. Uh, Karamanjari root is ground and smeared upon the bodies of the target, and, consequent, and consequently, the weapons are immobilized. The weapons cannot hurt anyone. Or for a womb, if you have uh, a woman whose womb is uh, prone to vaginal bleeding or miscarriage, leading to unsuccessful pregnancy, various herbs can be mixed with cow or goat milk over a couple of days to make the womb firm. Garbastiro. Uh, present, uh, preventing miscarriage. So it's not all aggressive. Bewildering or mohana. Bewildering from the root muhu, um, which means gladdening or confusing, uh, begets madness, agitation, and intoxication. The results are always psychological. They're not physical because you're bewildering someone's mind. Um, the root can this root mu or that becomes mohana can be can be uh, also mean perplexed, infatuated, stupefied, confounded, misled, tempted, and seduced. So when you get to erotic bewildering effects, they're always mental and emotional. Now what happens is seduction here removes resistance to amorous advances, or it creates loving feelings that were not naturally arising. All right, bewildering rites. So our first one, let's look at this mantra. So it's Om Hrim, O Kali, Skull Bearer, She Who Bellows, Goranadani, or She with a terrifying, She who makes a terrifying noise. Bewilder the universe, bewilder mankind, bewilder everything, bewilder, ta ta ta, swaha. So here we have Kali, the um, Hindu goddess from the Eastern India who has her tongue stuck out. She's a ferocious goddess, but also a loving mother. She wears garlands of skulls, and she's often depicted standing upon an unconscious or possibly a dead husband who is Shiva, often, the high Hindu god. So how, is this, how does this work? Well, um, in one particular ritual, we read that when smeared upon the body, the Brahma, the Brahma Dundi, which means like Brahma's staff, root, brown with white, abras practeris juice, uh, bewilders all mankind. Should the operator consume tulsi leaves dried in the shade mixed with vijaya seeds, uh, Fisalasis floxua, the ashwagandha that people are using in uh, quite a bit of contemporary herbalism in the United States, tawny colored cow milk, so it's a specific type of cow, bunion seeds, and abras practeria seeds. He bewilders all mankind from the moment he rises in the morning. So we have two rituals that are caused to bewilder all folks who look at them. <clears throat> okay, but descent. These are some of my favorites. Descent rituals are, oops, I got the wrong word there. It's from vidweshana, not akarshana, vidweshana. So that comes from the root dwesh, meaning to hate, to show hatred, or to become a rival or an enemy. Dissent rituals bestow enmity, create hostility between folks previously loyal, if not intimate. Another useful translation of this is, um, is mutiny. So these, what happens is in domestic, in the domestic world, you make fathers and sons hate each other. In the legal world, you make pr your clients hate one another, so the lawyer can so the a challenging lawyer can pick them apart, or you make the judge hate your opponent, or you can do all sorts of things there. Or you could make the whole jury, if we're thinking in the modern Western world, just hate each other so much they can't get anything done. Political, um, quite simply, uh, you, make your, you make your opposing parties and your opposing kingdom mutinous. Um, in the military, there's a lot of rituals for making the, for making the whole army dissent and run off. Um, in the courtly world, you would be, when I'm like in a king's court, you would be getting the people around you or your rivals, the king, to hate one another so that they can't bind in coalition against you. A lot of these use sympathetic magic. So when I say sympathetic magic, once again, I mean, you know, putting stuff up in the natural world on and manipulating that in magic to cause what you do in a small ritual space to affect the greater world. Here, complicated ritual actions manipulate persuasive analogies to transfer the enmity of natural rivals onto intimates. 
if you were to put a snake and a mongoose in a cage, sparks are gonna fly. If you combine snake scales and mongoose, and mongoose fur and direct that manipulation towards intimate people, they will likewise quarrel like a snake and a mongoose. That's what I mean by it. So natural enemies, crows and owls, cats and mice. If you take that natural hatred between those two creatures and put it on to people who love one another, they're not gonna get along so well. So let's look at some of these rituals. Uh, the first mantra we have is Om, reverence to Narayana. Cause so-and-so to hate so-and-so. Do it, Swaha. Narayana is a name for Shiva, the man who, the, and it means something like he who rides a man. Um, it's a common epithet for Vishnu, did I say Shiva, I'm sorry, for Vishnu for and for Krishna. So here is one of my favorite rituals in the world. You take the wing of a crow in one hand and the wing of an owl in the other, and having performed mantra consecration, so mantras over those things, the practitioner joins the two wings in front of him and binds them up with black thread. Wings in hand, he makes water offerings. He performs 108, water, 108 mantra offerings for seven days, and then his targets will hate one another. Intriguingly, one scholar told me he was walking in Benares down in Asigat, one morning and he found a wing of a crow and a wing of an owl bound together with blue thread, he told me. And when he opened up, there was a mantra on the inside, but it was an Arabic script. Um, I'm not gonna get into the sort of Indian Muslim versions of these rituals, but they're, they're equally vast and talk off one another, the Muslim and Hindu sort of ritual traditions of magic. So there's also a sort of what I like to call, so that, first ritual with a persuasive analogy or may those people become like these two things, like these analogous things. Um, the, I'm gonna talk about another version of it, which is a little less often, but is found, what I call sort of toxic radiance. So in this, what you're trying to do is create what we call a fetish or a hidden thing that will radiate a quality out amongst all who are around it. So we read, um, this one, combining the feces of a cat and a mouse and mix them with the dust of an enemy's foot. We'll see that often. Is footprint dust or foot gathered or dust gathered from his foot is like a pure trace of the human being. And if you can get that of someone's, then you can put that to, as a stand in for that person's sort of vital essence in any ritual. <laughs> so, uh, feces of a cat and a mouse and mix them with the dust from an enemy's feet to make a pleasantly formed man-shaped doll consecrated by 100 mantra repetitions. Wrap up the doll with blue cloth and bury it in a victim's house. This will swiftly create dissent between parents, children, and relatives. And another one, you take the, the urine of a cat and I think the feces of a mouse and make incense and burn it into people's house and it makes everybody really hostile, which also makes me think, wait, did you just make it really stinky in there and everybody's mad because it smelled bad? Could be. Could be. Or finally, we have our prickly guy here, the porcupine, who is not only prickly if you touch him, but is known for having a reclusive antisocial countenance. So a consecrated porcupine quill, the, pun, the porcupine being a cantankerous recluse who also bestows pricks, when one staked secretly in a house will create general hostility in the household. So you take the porcupine pill, quill, put the muncher on it, and then just hide it in their house somewhere and it'll cause everybody to hate each other. Eradication or ujjatana. Eradication drives a victim from his home, village, or kingdom or country. The target will wander and become a stranger in his own land, perpetually a foreigner wherever he goes, no matter where he lies. Uh, the root is uh, this chut with a prefix ud, and it means something like to drive away or break away or drive off, but like literally it's like make a, make a break. So the person is broken from all of their family and social ties. Now, in, psychologically, they describe these people wandering around in a degenerated mental state. And some interpreters have thought that Uchatana actually means stupefaction. But I would say that wandering perpetually in a confused manner does look a little stupefied. So the odd thing is we find our first ethical injunction. Throughout all of these lists of rituals, we don't see any reason, any like times you're supposed to do these rituals or when you're not supposed to do these rituals. We do see this rich, this statement, listen up. One should practice forcible eradication and slaying, so this would be chaptana and marana or murder, by means of which home, 
field, so that's land, wife, wealth, and children are seized. The reason to drive someone off or the reason to kill them is to take their place, to usurp their place in their family, to take their wealth, to take their wife, to become their children's fathers. The only ethical argument I've found or argument about ethics in this is that uh, don't do this to just anybody. You should only do it when you're trying to basically take over their lives, which is intriguing and kind of terrifying. So what are some eradication rites? Well, um, we hear one mantra to the god Rudra, who's a very old, very old god found in the Vedic traditions. He's often associated with Shiva, with Shiva now. So Om, reference to the glorious Gape Maud Rudra, immediately eradicates so-and-so from his own clan and progeny. Eradicate, kill, kill, burn, burn, cook, cook. So that'd be Mara, Mara, Pacha, Pacha, Daha, Daha. Um, pat, swaha, ta, ta. All right, so at, on that mantra, what are we going to do with it? Well, um, we read about how, da, 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 da. we read about how if you go and take a bunch of, sh of mustard seeds that you see above and you use them to worship on a Shiva Linga, that's that thing down there, the, uh, the large black sort of obelisk. Uh, so you smear the Shivalinga with funeral ash, so bodily ashes, Brahmanand, the Brahmanandi plant, and white mustard seeds. This is accompanied by the mantra repetition from above to charge the mustard seeds that you were using worshiping for deadly power. On a Saturday, the mustard seeds are deposited in the house of the victim. Consequently, the enemy is eradicated unto his own death. Now, there's another ritual that I found somewhere that talked about removing mustard seeds from someone's house to keep them from being um, affected by magic, but they're not clearly connected here. But mustard seeds uh, are often used in these rituals. Also, so worshiping of Shivalinga means, you know, there's some Shiva associations here. Uh, the majority of these rites are associated with the god Shiva. However, there's also a tradition in eradication rites of using consecrated stakes, like we saw at the beginning of this uh, lecture when I read that quote to you, the cha-cha-cha one. Uh, in this one, take up a four angula long stake made from udumbara wood, consecrate it with the eradication mantra, and bury the stake underneath the victim's bed, causing the victim to flee. Aha! Uh -huh. In another method, on a Tuesday, it's always Tuesday, the sorcerer should bury a four angula long stake made from human bone and then urinate over the spot where it is buried. The victim will be driven away. Try that one. Attraction or a karshina. Now, attraction rituals are both sort of physical and psychological, and they mostly target human beings, though they will do things like drawing toward you like um, herd animals, like you might want to collect. And surprisingly, there's a number of akarshina snakes, so attraction rituals for poisonous, deadly snakes. That's a whole other ball game. <laughs> um, I can give a whole other lecture on that. All right, physical attraction pulls a victim to the vicinity of the, forcer, of, of the sorcerer, even from a long ways away. Psychological attraction rights fascinate or bewitch, creating a hypnotic focus or pull toward the sorcerer. Um, targets are mostly women to be seduced or enemies to be murdered. These victims are drawn by an unseen force like the tractor beam of science fiction. Tractor beam from ad, what is actually shortened form of a tractor beam in sci-fi literature. Uh, all right, so um, the term is derived from a uh, and krish, which means sort of to pull toward. The root krish means to plow or to make, well, to make uh, furrows, but in this you gotta remember that Indians had like a long curved hand plow that you dig into the ground and pull toward you. And so when we think of a plow, we think of a V-shaped implement uh, with handles on it that's pulled by a horse that is pulled and breaks through the earth. Let's think of this as a plow that is, works more like a hoe <laughs> in gardening. Uh, so akarshana resonates with this English translation of a tractor. So the prefix ad or up is attached to the Latin derived track from tractus, meaning to pull forth, to pull along like a sci-fi tractor beam. So Akarshana writes, what are they? What do they do? Um, so our first mantra that we have is Om, a reference to the primordial man, Adi Purusha, which can be a number of figures or just a high god. Attract so-and-so, do it, swaha. 
Um, there's this great ritual here that I quite like. One should inscribe this, the mantra, in his blood using his ring finger, like this. Now, this is the Tarjuna Angali, the cursing finger. This is the ring finger or the naming figure. That's the middle finger. That's the biggest figure. And the biggest or the best finger is the thumb. And this is just called the little, the little finger, it's the baby finger there. So there are some similarities in the way we name our fingers. But I'm a big fan of Tarjuna Angali. This one, this is the pointing finger, the scolding finger, and the cursing finger. But anyway, so we're using this finger. The name of the victim is inscribed in the middle of the mantra using the sorcerer's own blood. And the mantra should, has been made into like an amulet on a piece of paper, should be deposited in a vessel filled with liquor. Then the victim will become attracted. This is the declared result of the ritual. Because the spell is difficult, even for the gods, not just anybody should be taught that ritual. So the idea is you take the essence of the person and instill it with into, the, into this amulet that is said to bring someone forth, and then you dump it in this pot of liquor. And I like to think that the person shows up all soused and drunk and with loving on their minds when they show up all soused from being bathed in the liquor. Um, okay, so uh, one curious rite um, that's also an attraction rite manipulates urine to attract a woman, suggesting re uh, resonances with scent and musk. I need to think about urine more in these rituals. So um, a, a version of the person or a simulacrum is deposited in a latrine. This is your target a place redolent of demons with potential for possession. In Indian literature, people are often possessed when going to urinate. Uh, all right, so you bury a version of the person in a latrine, and then the practitioner continually urinates there. He shall attract that woman who is a target, even if she is a vast distance away. And finally, this is our last big magic right for <laughs> this lecture, then we're gonna go briefly into the other two categories. Murder. So, um, murder or marana, it comes, these rites kill, slay, or destroy, and they don't have a lot of nuance. Marana is described from the root mri, meaning to kill or to slay, and it is the Indo-European cognate to the English word murder, because remember, Sanskrit and English are a part of the same language family, the Indo-European language family. So, there's no kind of noble interpretation of this. So somebody, and Buddhists do this, like, oh, the only time you should use murder is if you're trying to kill someone that's gonna hurt the Dharma, or you kill someone before they kill themselves, or you kill someone before they commit this like great sin that will cause them to go to hell around for all eternity. That's not found in these texts. These are just to kill people. There's no good interpretation of this. The only time there's anything that's even talked about with ethics, we saw it before with, um, Uchaptana, eradication, and Radha, or murder, uh, Vajra slaying, is that you do this, you kill someone, so you take their life, you take their wife, you take their money, you take their children. That's, that's what you do. These are murder rituals. They're there to kill. There's been um, prior interpretations that are really torturous, that call this like liquidation, but no, this is murder, killing. These are murder rites. They're stark, they're diabolical, they have a really ugly look to them, in fact. Um, we do have this statement. This is uh, out of the Sanskrit. It says, murder should not be performed frivolously against anybody at any time. This dangerous ritual that ends life should be done out of the desire for wealth and prosperity. Should a fool perform the rituals in this mantra and tantra, he will himself be assailed. For the sake of self-preservation, murderous sorcery should never be performed. Only a holy man having broadly discerned the rituals in the situation should ever perform murder, murder sorcery. Otherwise, sin is incurred. Should one perform murder sorcery, it should be done in the following manner. So like so many Sanskrit texts, like don't ever do this, but here's how you do it. And you see this in a lot of really aggressive magic rituals. Uh, you'll, you'll see at the beginning of them, uh, worldwide in many cultures, you'll see it starts with, don't ever do this. Here's how you do this. Such is life. Um, so murder rituals, these have gods that are kind of scary. <laughs> so, you know, gods like Chandali over here on the top, and then we have Kali, and then we have on the right, we have Bhairava, who is a very popular god, often associated with wrathful Shiva. He's also called the god of justice. 
he is the tutelary, he's a very prominent deity in Nepal. He's often worshiped as just a mask over a stone, as you see here. So who are we talking about here? Om, O oh fierce goddess, Chandalini, <clears throat> Chandalini, uh, dweller in Kamakya, where that's a, it's an area where there are quite a few wrathful goddesses. Impassable forest goddess, Vanadurga, clean, clean, kaswaha. This is inscribed on a birch sheaf using orpiment, that's bile, and saffron as yellow ink, tied around the sorcerer's neck on a Saturday or Tuesday, the amulet kills an enemy. Boom, so this is just make an amulet, wear it around your neck, it kills the one you want to have killed. Now, um, murder rituals are kind of intriguing because they are some of the longest rituals in any of these texts, but there's also the fewest rituals in any of these texts. So a lot of murder sections will only have like six rituals in them in a tantra, but all the rituals will be like four pages long and are really complicated. So let's look at one, make a doll from the enemy's foot dust. Remember that footprint dust, cremation ash, so ash from a body, and blood from one's middle finger. Cover the doll with black cloth and bind it with black thread. The image, so that entity, is laid upon a bed of kusha grass and then burned. Kusha grass is grass that's often used in Vedic sacrifice. One should perform 10,000 repetitions of the mantra before. Afterward, one should be for, perform 108 mantras to consecrate 108 mung beans, endowing the seeds with the potency of this majestic mantra. Deposit all those beans into the middle of the forehead of the doll, should he perform this endeavor or yoga, see, yoga as a magic ritual, at midnight, he will even kill a victim equal to Indra, the highest of the gods. Should he deposit the doll at the edge of a cemetery, then after the passing of one month, the enemy will be dead. So this ritual, and the next one I'm going to read to you, is not just found in the Sanskrit sources, but, but both these two rituals uh, I've seen observed in the ethnographic record, especially the work of Beni Gupta on folk rituals and religions of Rajasthan. She recorded these discussions of these rituals in the 1970s. So to some degree, these rituals are likely still performed. Though, because I'm more of a textualist than an, anthropo than an anthropologist, I can't tell you more about it. Uh, often when I think about this, I like to think of these little effigies as being like sort of like voodoo dolls. And voodoo dolls are also not found in Budun, the Afro-Caribbean religion. Um, but they are found in our pop cultures. So if I refer to voodoo dolls, I'm not talking about Budun, the, an actual religion, but I'm talking about sort of a pop culture figure. All right, so let's look at one more of these. Om, oh, glorious. And this is interesting because it connects the notion of blood and lifespan. I'll talk about that in a second. Om, oh, glorious, goddess of the drenched cloth, Adra Pateshwari. Oh, she was garbed in green and blue. Oh, dark one. Oh, salivator. Oh, fierce one, howler, skull bearer. Flaming mouths, uh, seven tongues of flames, the thousand-eyed one approach. So lots of those are wrathful goddess names and euphemisms for them. Approach so-and-so, I offer you an animal. Cut off the life of so-and-so. Approach, approach, you who steal away lives. Hum pat bur buhu, swaha pat. You that devours cloth soaked in blood. Cleave my enemies, cleave, drink the blood, drink. Hum pat swaha. What's all this about cleaving and drinking blood? Well, let's see. So mere mantra repetition of that mantra will kill an enemy after one month. Begin on the dark, dark eighth of the fortnight. So the Indian calendar is divided into two week chunks. <laughs> they, you can consider uh, 14 day fortnights. Uh, okay, he should perform mantra repetition with the name of the enemy inserted into the mantra. So the so-and-so should have your enemy. If, if your enemy's name is, um, is Bill spanks a lot, uh, then you put Bill spanks a lot in there. Uh, okay, he would make a doll using the dust of, from the foot or the footprint of his enemy. Having made a tribute sacrifice or bully of a young goat, he gathers the blood and shokes and soaks clothing or cloth with that goat blood. You cover the effigy and wrap it tight with that bloody cloth. When the cloth has dried, then the enemy will be destroyed. The power of this great enemy, or of this great mantra kills the enemy, should there be no doubt. So what's going on here? You create this image of your enemy, you wrap it with bloody cloth, and as the cloth dries, it shrinks up, just as, and just as that blood shrinks up, as that blood shrinks up and dries, it's thought that as it becomes fully dry, that's also the drying up of the life force within the target of this ritual. It's called shushin, or desiccation. And the idea is that the goddess drinks up that blood, and at the same time, she drinks the bloody life force of the victim. 
So finally, under uh, Moderna, we see destruction rights or knocking out. I just want to go over sort of quickly. Um, these usually destroy a person's livelihood. And, and this is from a section of making consecrated stakes that sort of destroy someone's life. So during the first fortnight of Palgun, the sorcerer should take up an eight <clears throat> finger length stake made from buttery wood. Should he bury this in the fisherman's house, his fish will be destroyed, i.e. his fish will spoil or he will not catch any fish. We realize it's actually because the water is heated up that he's keeping the fish in and that causes the fish to, uh, to rot. How do we know it's that? Well, the mantra says, Om, cook. Cook the water, swaha, and it's effective after 10,000 repetitions. So my guess is the, the live fish are being kept in water pots or live, live tanks. The water heats up, kills the fish, or they're, no, nah, the fish wouldn't have been fresh slaughtered. They're going to keep those alive as long as possible. Heck, they're half alive when they're in the, uh, the markets when, I, when I'm in India. All right, fantastic feats and enchanted objects. We're going to go over the two last categories of magic very briefly, though. So some operations are not categorized. They don't fall under the six results, such as the fantastic feats in which the operator is able to perform powerful super mundane actions, including invisibility or resurrection as a result of performing rituals. Remember, all of these are as a, a result of ritual. They aren't just powers that someone has. They're all results of a ritual. So boots to walk across the earth very quickly uh, are the enchanted objects. And what are the enchanted objects? They enable advantageous results, such as goggles to see under the water or under the earth, lamps to detect treasure, boots that you can stride across water or stride across the land very, very quickly, and to get rid of vermins. Now, um, let's talk about the top one. Uh, um, yeah, let, let's just run through these. So, um, we do read about one ritual to create the magic boots that says, Om, reverence to the Lord who dwells atop the moon. To him, atop the crest of the moon, the top of the mountain, the tip of the sphere. This is Shiva. Uh, reverence to the wide ranging, swift footed Lord. Lord, whom pat swaha. You repeat this 3,000 times. Then you combine in equal parts the fat, eyes, intestines, and blood from a mina bird, also the bile and eyes of a crow, saffron, and citron, and fat, plus the marrow from a dog. This is all mixed together with camel milk. One should smear this on his feet and make references to Shiva using the mantra I just said. The aim of this technique is to go any place in the blink of an eye. <laughs> he roams about the sky and sports like Shiva. Um, all right, there's a wide range of rituals also to ward off these varmints. As I said, <laughs> here's one. Having ground the shit from a civet cat and palm liquor, he smears it upon a rat. Where the other rats smell this, they will instantly leave the house and go elsewhere. When we think this is just because a civet cat, <coughs> the smell of it being on the other rats and mice would cause the mice and rats to be afraid of thinking for it. Now, what gets really curious and what got me started thinking about magic in the first place in my career was I was interested in rituals that bring the dead back to life. So um, we're going to re read through kind of a long ritual that is the last ritual found in one of the texts. And I, I will once again note to you, or I will at least do I make a joke about this later? Uh, I know. But we've got walking across the earth, driving away pigs, uh, or walking across water, driving away pigs, driving off varmints, and revivifying the dead. These sound quite like the, the miracles of sort of the wonder, the wonder worker, Christ type figures in the Hellenistic world. So people do argue often that Christ was a yogi. I see no <laughs> instance of that considering what we refer to as yoga and even writing on yogic powers don't really start until the fourth century. So I don't think Christ went to India to learn his magical arts. But when you look at the miracles of Christ, they look quite a bit like the magical results of the rituals that I've described here, the non-aggressive ones, though he does curse that tree. But we can also see that while human consciousness might not be the same, we all look for similar things. And what is the greatest of all magical death, of all magical acts, is bringing the dead back to life. So how do you bring the dead back to life? And if you're wondering about this picture, it's from my favorite horror movie, uh, The Reanimator. And it's a, it's a guy reanimating another guy's head, and his body is behind him, and he's coming after him. Well, it's a lovely little film from the early 80s. So, um, revivifying the dead are sanjivana, which is um, bringing, returning, bringing life back together, is common as, and it's usually actually one of the final rituals in 
uh, these uh, magic tantras. So the mantra is Om, reverence to those beautiful ones, the terrifying ones, to those more terrible than the terrifying. Reverence to them all, reverence to the arrow throwing ones. These are references to actually really old uh, Vedic gods. Now listen to this. Next, under the Amkola tree, the operator worships a linga, so Shiva worship, and an unfired pot, and then winds a single thread around that tree, the linga, and the pot. Four practitioners perform prostrations and worship using the perfected mantra. Then ripened fruits and flowers are gathered, cooked, and used to fill the pot. The pot is worshiped with sandalwood, flowers, and unbroken grains. Having removed the chaff from the seeds of the grains, he rubs them on the jar's mouth that is then covered with a large plate that is likewise smeared with auspicious substances and dirt gathered from a potter's hands. Seeds are, are seed garlands are strung, so like strings of seeds, like rudraksha seeds or prayer beads, are strung atop the pot. When dry, the copper pot is put on top and another one put underneath. Cook this in hot oil and save the oil. A half portion of that oil is combined with any equal part sesame oil. After cooling, the oil is applied to a corpse and the corpse will immediately return to life or go favorably to the land of Yama, the land of the dead. So they'll either come back to life or they'll have a, a birth into a heaven or a, a good rebirth. So they're hedging their bets a bit there. Those killed by snakes, disease and the like will surely return to life. Bringing the dead back to life. All right, our final category is female spirit conjuring or yakshini sadhana. <laughs> so you have yakshinis, which are these sort of uh, scary goblin spirits, yoginis that are animal headed flying goddesses, bhutanis, ghost gals, naganis uh, are um, serpent entities. Okay. These conjuring rites are found throughout the magic tantras, though there are a couple of, the, of, of texts that I have found that are solely dedicated to these, in which the operator in which you do these rituals, generally speaking, you go to a lonely place, be it a ruined temple, a river bank, uh, most often a solitary tree, and you make worshipful offerings there while chanting a mantra to his desired cosmic lady. Should he be successful, she will arise. Some texts say you hear the tinkling of ankle bells behind you or a whoosh of wind or a sound of singing. Um, others say that she just, you turn and there she is. She has physically appeared to you. Uh, now, upon her, her arrival, depending on how she is greeted, whether she, you give her the proper gifts to a sister or a mother or wife, she'll grant you magical gifts, glorious wealth, temporal power, or even perform super actions for you, such as hoist you on her back and carry you up through the heavens. Wendy Doniger delightfully said about these sort of tantric encounters that when you meet the goddess, if you're heroic and are brave, you will be their darling. If you show fear and trepidation, you will be her dinner. So these are ambivalent. When you contact a goddess like this, if she likes you, you're set. If she doesn't, you're done for. Okay, so let's read one of these rites in particular. Om Hri, come, come, O Sura Sundari. Sura Sundari is a goddess that generally, she's like a general goddess referring to Yakshinis, and her name is like um, the most delightful of the beautiful or the godliest, most beautiful one. Swaha! Positioned in a Vajrapani temple. Now, Vajrapani is a Buddhist deity. Um, thought to be one of the often wrathful Buddhists. So I would argue this text in a, from, a, from a Hindu scripture is actually borrowing from Hindu, is actually borrowing from Buddhism. But even further back, Vajrapani was a yaksha, your yakshini female, yaksha male. So this is either referring to a ruined um, Buddhist temple or to a temple to a very old yaksha god or tree spirit. The, the practitioner offers bedalium fumigation, so bedalium uh, incense, and performs worship daily for a month during the three temporal conjunctions. She will appear before his eyes. On a final day, he offers her oblation with red and white, which likely stands for semen and menstrual blood. Having arrived, she becomes either a mother, a sister, or a wife and acts appropriately. If she is a mother, she gives him perfected alchemical substances. If she is a sister, she gives him renowned priceless clothing. If she is a wife, she richly bestows upon him universal sovereignty. However, should his bed be occupied by another person, she will desire to either make love to him or murder him. So she's a jealous goddess. 
um, when she arrives. So be careful. All right, so what are the implications of all of this? Well, magic rituals are usually categorized as magic. And magic as a category is usually rejected, considered slippery, nonspecific, reductive, or dismissive. Magic is reduced to quackery, false practices, and the malpractice of medicine. I remember the first lecture I gave on this, my colleague stood up and said, I thought we were gonna talk about Buddhism. We're just talking about this quackery, this old nonsense, this fake medicine. I'm like, I don't know. I think we're talking about the very essence of how people relate to gods and goddesses, um, the way people interact with the world and see their world, their place in the world, a reflection of their social tensions that are um, described in these practices, their material culture, what things and herbs and substances and animals people are interacting with all the time. We do find, in fact, that magic alleviates pain. I make this point often, at least the pain of inertia, and it creates meaning even though it deploys religious structures and, sim and uh, symbols in an unsanctioned manner. So these rituals look like other rituals, but they're not done in a way an orthodox, an orthodox Brahmin would accept. Um, magic highlights the transaction with and coercion of deities. Now this is, an, this is anathema or considered forbidden to monotheist scholars of devotion oriented Hindus. If you think Hinduism is all about just loving God. Well, this isn't about loving God. It's about transacting with gods, many gods. If you're a monotheist that believes that God cannot be influenced in any way and all the world is predestined by God and is under God's rule, well, then what is this magic that is seeking to change the very order of things, to alter stuff uh, and alter events according to one's own desires? These magic rituals are normal. They're ubiquitous. I mean, they are, while lots of Indians don't practice these, people know about them, they hear about them, they worry about them. And in the internet age, more and more people are soliciting priests to do these than ever because you can get on WhatsApp and be in secret, cryptid, um, encrypted communication with ritual practitioners that aren't in your immediate vicinity. So it's not like somebody can say, I saw you talking to that sorcerer last night. Who are you trying to get in bed? Who are you trying to kill? Whose money are you trying to take? You can contact them over the internet. They can do the ritual and no one will be the wiser. So Hindus pejoratively pepper their vernacular language, whether it's Hindi, Tamil, or Bengali with the term black magic. So they'll be talking right along and I'll be talking them through an interpreter or I'll be speaking in Hindi with them and they'll just shift and drop that word black magic in. So they'll tell, call these rituals Tantra Mantra, or the, which is, uh, let's not even worry about that term, or they'll just straight up use the English words black magic. So delineating and describing magic rituals in this way suggests a new approach to study and compare magic rituals. These are ready for comparison. So while when we think about magic and the magical, we usually talk about magic powers that are bestowed by God or created by extensive personal sanctity, these <clears throat> we need to actually turn away from those magic powers and turn toward magic rituals to reject fuzzy terms like magical in use of uh, a more specific ritual genre, which is these magic rituals like the Shatakarmani, the Kautuka Karma, and Yakshini Sadhana. This approach opens archives previously dismissed and rarely translated, be they published or in manuscript forms, including the vast Ud Corpus. And furthermore, this data is just ripe for using comparisons. Magic rituals ought to be viewed alongside Hellenistic spell troves, medieval European low magic grimoires, Western natural magic, the contemporary pragmatic spell craft of African-American hoodoo, and contemporary, and contemporary neo-pagan kitchen magic, with a caveat that neo-pagans reject and hoodoo folk embrace aggressive magic results, to name a few. The stakes are nothing less <laughs> than the nature of ritual, and the nature of religion. And I just want to point at it one more time. When you look at the miracles of Christ, which are representative of a wide mythical range in the Hellenistic world, you see that a lot of them look like some of these rituals we described. So while the Hellenistic, Egyptian, Jewish, and Christian and, Neo, uh, and Neoplatonic texts have had their magic rituals <laughs> easily compared because they were using similar languages, or from a similar time, they haven't been put in conversation with all of this Indic material. And I think it just, it does literally bring us to a greater understanding of the role of ritual in our lives, 
to look at these types of rituals and look at them together and actually wonder what are the stakes of any of the rituals that we do. It's fun to think about. I'll see you next time.